your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians. You can turn that on now. Yeah, there we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. And the title is, The Battle is in Our Mind. How, how many believe that right now without hearing this message? The battle is in our mind. It really is. You know, you hear that. You know, it's willpower. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the world says. But really, the battle is in our mind. As a Christian, we know that greater is Christ who is in us than he is in the world. But if we believe the lie of the devil, then how many know he has, his lie has power in our life? Even though it shouldn't have power, even though he's been a defeated, right? We, he's been a defeated foe. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. Amen? We just have to stand our ground in Christ. And that's why, as we see, as you guys study it more in depth, we'll see that the weapons or the, the armor, there's no rear guard. There's nothing. And I've told you before, it's kind of like the buffalo, that when the wolves come after a buffalo, if the buffalo just stand his ground, he can knock a, a, a wolf from about here to that wall and probably about as high as those windows, the top of those windows, as high as the ceiling. How many know not too many wolves can take that very long? But as soon as that buffalo believes these wolves got him and runs, then it's over because they'll bite the back of his leg, bring him down, and then they'll bite his two or three of them, will bite his neck, and then it's over. But if he stood his ground, this is a National Geographic, they said he could probably fight off the wolves. How many know that's us? So again, the battle's in the mind. If we run or if we believe that he's greater or he has power in this area, how many know because we believe it, he has power in that area? Not because he should, but because we believe the lie. Tonight we're going to see, go through the armor of God or one part of it. And I heard this week, I heard a Bible or a couple weeks ago, a Bible teacher share this. And I just really thought it was an interesting concept. And it really made sense to me because I'd studied the armor of God, taught on it many times. But I'd never seen this before. And I think it's worth repeating. And uh, kind of I took what he said and kind of added to it. You know me. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about. So let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you so much for this time of worship that we had. Now I ask that you would just speak to us powerfully. That, Father God, we, we Lord, we, a lot of us here, we know your word. But as I realize, a lot of times I quote your word, and I can recite your word, and I even think I understand your word. But a lot of times I don't really believe your word. I don't let it be the bedrock of my life to where I just anchor my life in it. And I sometimes say, yeah, I know, but... And I add the but in there. And I pray, God, that tonight we would reconcile that as your word says, let God be true and every man be a liar. Amen. Let every demon be a liar. Let every satanic attack or arrow be a lie. And may we believe your truth over what the world tells us, over what doctors tell us, over what people tell us, that we would say what God says is what's the most important thing. And so, God, I pray tonight that if there's any lies that have been embedded us through our past before Christ or even in Christ that have carried through to Christendom, that we would allow your word to remove those lies. Amen? That you would renew our minds and that, that every thought would be held captive and every thought would be in agreement with your word. That we wouldn't say, I believe your word, but yet have a thought that's contrary to your word or believe a statement that someone has maybe said over us that's contrary to your word. So, Father, we just give you this time. I ask for your anointing, and I pray that you wouldn't just anoint me, but you anoint everyone who's hearing, whether it be here or on the video, that your DVD, that you, Lord, would speak, and that you would anoint their ears, anoint their hearts to hear what your Spirit is saying to them, the church. And we pray this, and we believe for this, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone agreed, said... Amen. Wow, that was a quiet amen. Is everyone tired or something? Or you guys kind of mellow? Is it Wednesday night? All right, let's do Yeah, let's get through this. No, I'm just kidding. Tina didn't say that. But. All right. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, <clears throat> verse 3. And I'm reading from the New Living because I think it captures it very good. I usually read from the, the New King James, but I thought this was good, so I'm reading from the New Living. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. Verse 4. We use God's mighty weapons not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds 
of human reasoning. So hear that. Strongholds of human reasoning. And to destroy false arguments. Verse 5, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Now, a stronghold in the Greek means a castle or it means a fortress. It means that you, what, what the concept here is that when we believe a lie or we believe a something that is not true, we can give the devil a castle or a fortress to hide out in our brains and to have a place where he can work from. Does everyone want to kind of make sense to you? You can, a stronghold can be in our heads, because it's all in our heads. A stronghold is where we believe a lie, maybe from our childhood or through experience of life. We believe a lie, and that makes a stronghold or a fortress for the enemy to work out from. Does everyone, does some people know where I'm going? You, you go, yeah, I've seen that in my own life, right? And sometimes the way we think or the things we have been taught gives the devil or his demons a stronghold or foothold, as it says in Ephesians 4.27, it says what? And remember, he's talking to the Ephesian church that was a strong church. He's not talking to non-Christians, he's talking to a church, and he's saying what? Do not give into Ephesians 4.27, do not give into anger, which gives the devil what? A foothold or a place in our life. Now, isn't that amazing? It's funny, as Calvaryites, we don't believe that the devil can ever have a place in our life, yet the Word of God says that we can give the devil place in our life. He shouldn't have place, but we, through our free will and then choosing the way we think, can give the devil place. Does everyone track with that? If you don't agree, you're wrong, but no, I'm just kidding, I'm just teasing. No, what I'm just saying is that we can give the devil, I don't believe as a Christian can be possessed because you're sealed with the Spirit, but I believe we can be oppressed, a monkey on your back, a stronghold because of wrong thinking. Oh, let me say this. I didn't say this. If you have a question, this is the only time you can ever interrupt me when I'm preaching. But if you have a question and you really don't understand, if you feel bold enough, raise your hand and I will, you can ask me. Because I really want this to be not just a preaching time. I want it to be where if you have a question that you can ask and hopefully, if I don't have the answer, Kevin will for sure have the answer. But I would love to, for you, if you have a question, you can ask. That's why I'm putting the pulpit down here. That means you can ask questions. So... <laughs> We all know that the devil is the father of lies, right? Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning. And that, that for us as believers, the devil has no real power in our lives except what we give him mentally. Satan, hear this, would have had no power in Eve's life if she hadn't believed the lie. Did God really say? Now, what should she have done? Yes, God really said, so get out of here. <laughs> Sliver away, you know, I don't know, grab him, whip him or something. You know, he had legs then. But, you know, but uh, they said maybe he wasn't on his belly. So, but she should have just said, no, it is written, and spoke the truth against his lie. But what happened? She believed the lie. She was deceived by the lie, which gave it power, right? The lie had no power until she believed it. And then she ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And why does God allow two trees in the garden? Because he always has to have choice. You can't have real love without choice. So you have, the, tr you have the, the tree you can eat from, the good tree, the tree of God, fellowship, and then you have the tree of knowledge of good and evil because God always gives choice. And we have that choice to believe the truth of God or to believe a lie. Amen? And so there, what? Oh, my shirt. Whoa, I was like, what? My shirt's up? What? I was like, I was scared. I didn't have a chance to shower today. I know you really wanted to hear that, but uh, I, they ran, this day ran away from me, so if my hair is a little weird, it's because I plan to go at home, but I didn't have a chance, so I'm scruffy. Anyway, and I'm wearing a t-shirt, which I never do. But anyways, she believed the lie that if she ate from this tree, that she would be, hear this, and it was even a good lie, you know, and I mean a good lie in the sense it wasn't like, party. It was, if you eat this tree, you'll be more like God. So she was thinking, hey, that's good. I want to be more like God, right? And so this makes sense. But yet she should have remembered God said, don't eat from this tree. So she said, even though it seems to make sense, it doesn't make sense because God told me not to eat from this tree. Amen? 
that you believe the lie, and there it is. So it had power. Let me give you an example of this. I've told you this many times, but I always like repeating myself. It says, my grandma, my beloved grandma, used to tell me, she used to tuck me in bed, and she used to say, as she was tucking me in bed and snugly, she would say, Craig, Craigie, I just want you to know that nobody really cares. <laughs> Thanks, Grandma. You know, I mean, I'm three years old. Nobody really cares. Just, just, you need to know that. Now, hear me so I give some background. My grandma wasn't a Satanist, but here's what she was saying. She had been raised, her mom died when she was six. She was raised by Cinderella's mom. No, she was raised by a stepmom who didn't care about her. So she always felt odd man out. She had children, and she treated her terribly in love. So she believed that lie. How many know that's a lie of the devil? That no one cares? Right? How many know that's right? You see where I'm going? So, but she believed that, that no one cares. And so she was trying to warn me as a little kid just get this through your head that nobody cares. So if you know that, you won't get hurt. You get it? You see the, the reasoning, even though we know, wait, that's not very good. That's not true. And so whenever I would get hurt in life, I know none of you have been hurt, but I get hurt in life. What's the first thing you think the devil says to me? See? Nobody cares. I didn't think God cares because why would, if God cared, why would he allow this? And then I'd go, yeah, yeah, hey. And I know you guys are too spiritual. You never have ever gotten angry with God, right? But I'm like, hey, yeah. And then I never forget once when I was whining to God. How many, how many know God doesn't mind you whining to him as long as you let him correct your whine? Look at the Psalms with David, you know, you know, or Asaph. Oh, how the wicked prosper. Oh, how in vain have I sought. You know, in vain have I kept myself pure. And then it says, when I came into the, went into the temple, I realized... Oh, what a brute beast I was. I was a bonehead. I'm, I'm giving you the Craig version. But he says, and then I came to the temple and I realized how they're like the green grass here today and gone tomorrow. I came to my senses. Oh, my goodness. How many know God doesn't mind you telling the truth? Because he already sees your heart. He doesn't mind you telling the truth of how you feel as long as you will let him correct your wrong thinking. Amen? And so God one time got tired of me saying nobody cares. And he says, can I finish that statement once and for all? And I said, oh, you're God. Yes, you can. And he said, nobody cares like me. Pretty good. Only God could make a statement that clear. And he said, so you're, it's sort of true, but it's not that no one cares in this world, but nobody cares like me. And how many other times we, 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 we think, you know, oh, if I only find the right woman or the right man, and what happens? They're not perfect, right? And nobody can love us like Jesus. Amen? Nobody's going to fulfill us. No friendship, no person, not even our spouses can love us the way sometimes we need to be loved. Only Jesus really loves us the way we need to be loved. Amen? Amen. Middle of verse 5 again of 2 Corinthians 10. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That's why God also says in Romans 8, 7, he says, you can just write this down, you have to turn there, the carnal mind or the sinful mind is enmity or hostile towards God. Do you hear that? Whenever you believe, so if you ever believe a lie like that, your mind is carnal, it's, it's sinful, it's hostile towards God. Because what happens when you believe a lie? Usually you will turn against God a little bit, maybe not fall away, but you'll go, hey God, yeah, why don't you care? Do you see the hostility there? Because we believed a lie. So we have to capture, it says, every rebellious thought and teach them to obey Christ. So you have to take those thoughts when God reveals them to you and say, no, you're not going to believe that lie. You're going to believe the truth because what's the truth against that lie? Nobody cares. If God be for you, who can be against you? The, the truth is, I have loved you, it says in Jeremiah, with an everlasting love. So there you go. That lie is blown away by the truth. But you have to replace that lie Take that thought captive, say it's not true, replace it with the truth. Is everyone tracking with me? You all understand this? Maybe it's so simple, but it was pretty, pretty amazing for me last week. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 again. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false Arguments. Hear that real quick. I want you to really highlight strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. A lot of times our reasonings 
what we kind of reason out or kind of look at life and kind of come to a conclusion, our reasonings are not right. Especially if we're responding in hurt or responding with something like something went wrong like me and I go up, see, nobody cares, right? Because I'm using a natural thinking. I'm not walking by the Spirit. Our reasonings are not right, especially when we're not being led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Have you ever thought something was this way and then you find out it wasn't really the way you thought it was and you start to really... I love someone said, the older you get, usually the more you realize how little you know. When you're younger, you're really smart. Until you got older and you realize I'm not as smart as I thought I was. I love what Billy Graham said. I think he knows the Bible pretty well. He says, the more I get to know God, the more I see how little I know. And so you young people, just get that through your heads right now and you'll be way ahead of the game. Let me give you another example of this, of kind of reasonings that are wrong and reasoning in a wrong way or in a carnal way and just kind of remember how Jesus would say to the disciples why are you so dull you know why are you such a bonehead that's the message Bible why are you so dull you remember that I mean you think Jesus like that's almost kind of mean that's like saying to a mentally challenged person be smarter it just is kind of mean you think you sometimes I read that and I go why are you so dull I mean Jesus they're they're fishermen they're not like Einstein's give them a break but here my point, hopefully it'll, it'll make sense to you. Hear this. Let me give you, here's the example. Mark 8, verse 14. You can just write this down. Or if you're a really fast Bible turner, you can go there. But we're going to go back to, I think we're going to, are we going to go back? Yeah, we're going to go back. No, we're not. You can turn there if you want. Mark 8, verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. So hear that. That's key. They forgot to take bread with them. They did not even, not even have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Okay, so there's the key. They have no bread. They forgot one piece with them. There's 12 of them and with Jesus 13. Verse 15. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven or yeast of the Pharisees and the leaven or yeast of Herod. Now hear this. Verse 16. And they reasoned. Now, realize this reason is really wrong. They reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of their boneheadedness, okay, that's the mess about Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do, and so he's saying, wait, guys, you missed the whole thing. I am not talking about we didn't have enough bread. I'm talking about... Watch out for a religious system that supposedly has God at the center, but it has a form, has, doesn't have a personal relationship with him or have the power of God. Remember what it says in, in Timothy? It says uh, they'll have a form of Godness, but deny the power thereof. From such people, what? Turn away. Isn't that amazing? From religious people who say Jesus but have no power and their lives are not changed, you're to turn away from them. Isn't that amazing? And who did Jesus fight? Did he fight the prostitutes and the, and the tax collectors? He fought the Pharisees, the religious people that, that had a form but no real relationship with God. So that's what he's saying. But it says, Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive nor understand? Guys, how come you don't get this? Is your heart still hardened? Now hear that right there. I, want, I, didn't, I was in a hurry today, but that heart in there, do you see it? It's not saying you're a bonehead. It's saying, why, can't you, why are you not choosing to get this? Do you understand? It's like this. Let me give you an example. I don't know if this will fit for you. But we believe in divine healing. Amen? Yes. Now, you could say, but we've seen some people heal. We've seen people not healed. And so we get all these things going on. But how many know this? We went to the doctor yesterday, and the doctor says, we said, well, we're believing God for healing. And the doctor, <laughs> she kind of, well, this kind of tumor does not go away. Now, do you understand? I can harden my heart and go, <laughs> see, <laughs> God. Or I can go <laughs> to her and say, I've seen God do the impossible. Amen. You see what I mean? I can choose to believe the doctor over God, or I can choose to believe God over the doctor. Because the Lord reminded me, you saw a two and a half inch tear in an aorta healed by God overnight. 
And how does that happen? That's a hard surgery, they said, even to sew it up because you have to stop the heart because you can't have it pumping. And yet God did it overnight. I've seen that. I prayed for that. I stayed in the ICU and prayed all night and fasted and saw God do it in one night from five, in the, five at night or whenever ICU closes, seven, all the way till five in the morning and totally healed. And the Lord's like, did I change? You know, that was back in 94 or 92, but did I change? And I'm like, oh, if you can heal an aorta, you can heal breast cancer, amen? But they hardened their heart because they kind of, they started thinking of natural minds of, oh, bread, love in bread, it's got to be about bread. And they didn't really hear what God was saying. Hear this. Verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Like, are you, are you not seeing what I'm doing? And do you not remember when I broke five loaves? So here it is. So he's saying, hey, you guys are kind of dull, but let me remind you why I'm saying you're so dull. Okay, so here it is. He's being really nice now. He's kind of explaining himself. Verse 19, when I broke five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of, of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Verse 20, also when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said seven. And here's what Jesus says, verse 21. So he said to them, how is it that you don't understand? Do you hear what he's saying now? He says, you, are you serious? You're, you're, you're worried about bread? When you've seen me provide bread twice for thousands of people and you really think it's going to be hard for me to provide bread for 13 people? Are you serious? But isn't it us sometimes? God can meet our need one time. We're like, yeah, oh, thank you, God. And the next minute something else happens. We're like, God, where are you? And God's like, don't you remember what I just did a, a year ago? Yeah, but that was a year ago. You might have gotten older. I don't know. <laughs> right? And God's saying, choose to keep your heart soft to him to say, if you did it then, you can do it now. And so I believe. I still believe. You know, there's an old song by Russ Taff, I still believe. And we need to do that. We need to choose that. And that's what he's rebuking is they're kind of not, you know, just kind of going instantly to natural. Oh, leaven, bread, it's got to be over bread. And not remembering, wait a sec, that's silly because you've seen me provide for you and for thousands of other people. Why would you be worried about bread? But isn't it funny? Because I know none of us ever worry about our daily bread, do we? None of us worry about our economy. None of us freak out. And yet he says, I take care of the sparrows and, and aren't you much worth much more than these? And yet we still worry. But you never, do you ever see a bird going, I need help? You know, I've never seen a hummingbird. We, we, Mariah and I had a hummingbird just fly right by us. Yo! And Mariah's like, ah! You know, but I've never seen, can I have some sugar water? Seriously, there's nothing out here. I've never seen that. You know, God provides for them. You know? Um, they're thinking or reasoning that Jesus is warning us about is not having enough, they're, you know, they're thinking or reasoning that Jesus is, is warning us about is not having enough bread. But Jesus is saying, these guys, you're using human reasoning that says God will not provide for you, and that is a wrong reasoning or wrong thought or a lie, Right? Because I haven't, you know, he's saying, because I haven't shown you, haven't I shown you at least two major times of an incredibly miraculous way of providing with you from two loaves and what, two, two fishes, five loaves and two fishes? Are you serious? You're worried about my provision? And, and do you ever think about that? You know, we hear these guys get rebuked for this. Do you ever wonder what God feels about us sometimes? I mean, you know, we go, yeah, you boneheads, come on, man, yeah. But how many times has, has God, can anyone seriously say here, as a Christian, God has not provided for you? Now, sometimes he'll stretch it, but he has provided. Most of us are not anorexic. <laughs> he provides. Now, he might not provide all your wants, but he provides our needs. Amen? Amen? And if he can feed Elijah with a raven, I'm sure he can take care of us. He's going to need a big raven for me, but he can provide. Amen? Mine will be a stork with a big pouch thing. But anyways. So where did he, they, they get this human reasoning? Well, I believe it's from things like this. It's from Benjamin Franklin. Remember what he said? The gospel according to Benjamin Franklin? God helps those who help themselves. You forgot your bread. Now you're going to starve, right? 
you know. Maybe your dad said, you've got your lunch? Well, good, you're not going to have lunch today, you know. And we have that thing that we project to God, you know. Some of us have had harsh fathers. I realize sometimes why I am harsh is because I didn't have a father, and the kind of men in my life that were in my life, like my my grandpa and my uncle were kind of harsh, and so I sometimes project that to God, that God is kind of a harsh taskmaster, never pleased, a perfectionist, always, you're always never doing good enough. Anyone, anyone else out there like that, or am I the only weirdo? But just that, you know, it's never good enough, and so sometimes when you see me preaching and I'm going, whoosh, whoosh, just know I've beat myself way harder than I've beat you. Now you go, I don't care, it's still, I don't like it. But know that that's because I think sometimes I have wrong view of our Heavenly Father. Amen? You're quiet on that. You're like, yeah, I hope you get that, Craig, please. Now I want to move from another aspect of this into this. And now if you can turn quickly to Ephesians, and that's what we're going to, you guys are going to talk about. Ephesians 6, verse 16. I'm not going to go through all the armor of God. It will be here a long time, but I want us to look at this. Ephesians 6, verse 16. Is everyone there? Let me know when you're there. Wave your Bible. (laughs) Oh. Oh, they want me to show you my shirt. It says, Calvinism, this shirt chose me. But then on the back it says, Arminianism, I chose this shirt. So there it is. It's a Calvary thing. Balance. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I don't know about you, But as I said earlier, in my life as a Christian and even before Christ, Satan has slipped a few arrows past my shield of faith. Can anyone say amen? There's been a few times where Satan has said, hey, yeah, I know, but if God cared, why cancer? Or if God did this, why would people say this about you? You know, whatever, whatever, you can fill in the blank, right? But I want to tell you this real quick about this shield of faith. The reason why we teach the Word of God here verse by verse, and we really encourage you to know the Word, because how many know Jesus didn't let any arrows get past his shield of faith? How many know that? I don't believe, oh, oh, you know, he had a lot of arrows shot at him by the Pharisees and by Satan and by demons, but he never, I believe, an arrow got in. But think about Jesus. Jesus ministered to himself, the Word ministered to the Word, the Word. Does that make sense? Do you remember when Satan came and says, hey, you're hungry. You've fasted for 40 days. Turn, these bread into, turn this stone into bread. And he goes, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he says, okay, right, okay, I guess you got that one. Then he goes to the temple. He says, puts on the highest part of the temple. It's about 150 feet tall. And uh, he says, if you're really the son of God, then Throw yourself off because he will, and he even uses scripture. He uses Psalms 91. God will, will keep you from hitting your feet in any stone. And he says what? Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. Satan so goes, okay, well, let's get past that one. And then he says, if you will, will, he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, if you will bow down and worship me, then I will give you these kingdoms. Isn't it wild? You know, people go, I know people have fought me on this, but isn't it wild? Jesus didn't say these aren't yours to give. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But how many know there's some kingdoms or some governmental establishments that Satan has control over? He's trying to get good control over America, as you can see. But how many know hopefully we're going to pray and see that change? But how many know that he said, I can give you all this. I can make all these governments follow you. And Jesus said what? He didn't argue that. He just said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. And what happened? Satan said, well, one more try. No, he says, he left him. Why? Because he, Jesus ministered the truth. He used the sword to say, here's the truth. I'm not going to let your lie touch me. And then he ministered to himself to remind him when he was in a vulnerable state. How many know 40 days of not eating? You're a little bit maybe vulnerable. 
And he said he ministered the truth to himself that this is the way I should live and what I should think. Does that make sense? And I want to propose to you, if Jesus needed to minister the word to himself, how much more do we need to minister? You should have the word on your mirror. You should have the word. You should have little cards right on your dashboard, you know, when you're driving. You just kind of, no, but you should have the word everywhere. You should listen to the word. You should have the word. You, and you should try, when you have a lie, try to find a scripture that would combat that lie. And just meditate on it, memorize it, speak it. And when the devil w w shoots his arrows and speaks his little whispers of lies, you shoot back the truth and say, no, I choose to believe this. I hold the shield of faith and believe this rather than let your arrow touch and get into my heart or and get into my mind. How many know the mind and heart are one? It's our, our will and emotion, right? When people talk about, you know, love the Lord with all your heart. And so it means your soul and your mind are your will and emotion. It's your will. It's what you set your heart on. Amen. And only you can choose what you believe. Amen. But here's a really cool thing. The sword here mentioned here is not a big sword. It's not a, like, it's not the, the I love, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, Braveheart. It's not a, a, what do you call it, the big, uh, what do you call it, the broadsword. It's not a double-handed broadsword. And this is kind of interesting that this broadsword is so powerful that it could literally have done a test where they put skeletons or put gel skeletons and that's, that sword has been able to chop off three heads in one blow. And I know you guys go, ooh, sick. But that's pretty wild. Right? That's a pretty powerful sword. But the sword that it's talking about here is the Makara. It's the, it's the Makara. This is a Roman sword, which if you looked, remember if you saw Gladiator, the sword's only about... 18 to 2 feet long at most. And so it was a smaller sword, a one-handed sword, so you could have a shield and a sword, so you could kind of boom and block, boom, and you know what I mean? Because you couldn't do that with a big, huge broadsword. Does that make sense? So they realized that when they fought people with a broadsword and a makara, they usually, the makara and the shield beat the broadsword because you could hit it and then go in because they're like way out here and you're just shoom, right in there. Does that make sense? So that's the imagery that Paul or God through Paul is using. The makara, the Greek word translated makara, is a short sword. Paul mentioned it here as he mentioned in six, this verse. Is the Latin term I thought was kind of neat, gladius, from which we get the word gladiator. So that's kind of cool, you know, for guys, right? Gladiator. Scripture is not, is not a broad sword, and I can't say the word is ramphenia or something, that is waved indiscriminately, but a dagger to be used with great precision. It's either a dagger like Jesus to say it is written to the enemy, or as we're going to see, it's, a, it's a, another sword, and I'm going to wait for a second, but it can be used for something else, and that's the cool thing. One commentator mentions the makara, I like this, as a small knife of no great size. Hear this. It can also be described as a surgeon's scalpel, a surgery. So figure that out. Now you might be saying, well, that's great, Pastor Craig, but how does this help me with the arrows that get past my shield of faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. When lying arrows get through, you and I are to take the makara, that surgical scalpel, and we're supposed to cut out the lie or the human reasoning that speaks against God. Does that make sense? So you don't just take the word. I always thought of it just this way, right? But I'm thinking if it's just that way, I want a big, huge, you know, whing, you know, and take as many demons' heads off. But you see, it's a double-edged sword. It's not just double-edged, but it's two things. It's, it's to go against the enemy, but it's also to use on yourself. And I couldn't find it, but when this Bible teacher said that also they used it when the arrows would get through the side of their armor, they would use that makara to dig out those arrows, because, you know, you just don't pull an arrow out because it'll make it worse, but they would slowly kind of dig it out and get it out. And so, does everyone see that? I, I thought that was kind of cool. So that's what the word is for. It's f to, to cut out the lies or the wrong thinking and replace it with the, now hear this, he says, remember he said earlier, he said, he said, the fiery darts, and he says, take up the shield of faith, but hear this, he says, take up the helmet, and he says, the sword of the spirit, that's the makara, and he says, which is the Word of God. Now hear this. That word of God there is, is, not, uh, is not the logos, which is the uh, word for just the word. 
This is a rhema word. And you've heard me say rhema word quite a bit, but I'll say it for those you don't know. A rhema word, the rhema word is a specific word for a specific person at a specific time. So there's a lot of times where you can just, you, like I could just read about Peter, he walked on water. How many know that's not a rhema word for me? And that's probably not a word for you. If I said, okay, that's in the Bible, right? It says that he, he said, Lord, if it's you, walk out. So Lord, if it's you, I want to walk. How many know most of us would sink? Because it's not a specific word to us. Remember, Jesus said, if it's you, let me come out. He said, come out to Peter. But he didn't say, everyone walk on your pool and skim your pool on top of the pool. He didn't, you get, you get my point? It's a specific word for a specific person. So saying that, this last year, the Lord has really been speaking to me, as I said earlier, about being harsh at times. And Jennifer has really been roughing me up to be godly and loving, right? <laughs> okay, no, I'm just teasing. She goes, you're almost loving today. It was really good. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm just teasing. You're a good boy. No, okay. no, she didn't say that. I'm teasing you, Jennifer. But anyways, uh, but she has encouraged me, right, to be more loving. Um, and, and some of you just, I don't know, you think it's too far gone. But anyways, um, <laughs> but I'm harsh at times. And the reason I get so harsh, because I have to have a reason, right? I can't just be a jerk. I have a reason. Because I get mad at the blatant sin in the church. Anyone else get mad at that? Get frustrated with the blatant? No one else gets frustrated with the blatant sin? Okay, thank you. Right? You know, blatant pornography. Divorce is high in the church as the world. Uh, cussing in the middle of the church. No one even flinches. Um, you know, just you could name a ton of things. They say... On Christian dating site, Kevin said that, what was it, 40% of Christians or higher? 60? 62% of Christians who go to, you know, mingle.com or Christian.com don't think it's wrong to have sex before marriage. 62%. Don't even think it's wrong. So they don't think it's wrong. They're having sex. Amen? So, you know, if they're both in agreement. But, I mean, it gets frustrating to me. And so I get mad, and, and hear this, I look at Joel Olstein and I go, man, why can't I just be like Joel? 56 million, that's his net worth. He smiles, he says the hardest part of his day is he smiles, his cheeks hurt from smiling. <laughs> Sign me up. But then here's the part I don't like. So this is why I can't be Joel, even though sometimes I would like to at least have the money. No, I'm kidding. But is the... The part that gets me, and this is why I beat you, but sometimes I beat you too hard, is Jeremiah says what? They'll say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I can't do that, amen? I can't love you all the way. I can't, let me give you an example so you understand what I'm saying exactly. I can't tell the homosexual that God loves you just the way you are and don't ever think of changing. Amen? Amen? I have to tell the homosexual, God loves you. But he loves you so much, he's not going to leave you this way. And he wants to change you to the way he created you to be. Amen. Now, a lot of homosexuals, oh, that's not love. Yes, it is. Why is it love? Because I can love someone all the way to hell. But I guarantee you, if they see me, if I happen to be there when the white throne judgment, and they see me, and they know me, they're going to probably, remember I told you I had a dream of my friend saying, why didn't you tell me? If you knew this was the truth, why didn't you love me enough to tell me? And I want to tell you, I want to be somebody that, you know, my friend, my best friend Glenn, who's a drug dealer, a drug addict, and I, I was the one who got him in on that. He uh, committed suicide, and I told him about Jesus, and he spit in my face. But I'll tell you this, even though I'm very sad for my friend, I have peace that I told him about Christ. Even though... And he spit in my face. I said, I, you know, to hell with Glenn. I was like, you know, if you don't care, I don't care. And then the Lord said, that's not. And they showed me that dream about Glenn saying, why didn't you love me enough to tell me? And so I say that so you understand my heart. And how many know we as people go one extreme to the other? Amen. The Catholic Church was works, works, works. Martin Luther went this extreme to grace, 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 to where he said, remember he said, the book of James is a book of straw. I mean, that's extreme, saying, you know, I will show you my faith by my good works. He hated that. I mean, it's a balance, but we as people tend to go extreme. So here is, because most churches are screaming grace, 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 right? What do I tend to do? I'm going over here, 
not law, but come on, guys, let's live the word. Do you get it? And sometimes if you guys get cranky with me, you go, I'm going over to that church. It's grace, grace, grace. You know, I never forget someone said, I almost said the church, I'm a big church this way. This person said, gosh, Craig, it seems like, there, why is there like two gospels? And their gospel is a lot nicer and easier than yours. What do you say to that? You know, what do you say? I said, well, hopefully my gospel is the gospel. And Jesus said, count the cost. And, you know, I mean, you know, their gospel is a man-centered gospel about it's all about you. And really the gospel is, yes, Christ loved you and died for you, but now he asks you to give your life to him. Does that make sense? And so that's why sometimes you see me get a little cranky, a little mean, and you're like, he is just naughty. But I'm, but I'm doing it because you guys need a good spanking. Okay. No. But sometimes you do. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, I'd rather have someone tell me the truth a little firm than love me all the way to hell. Amen. That's just me. Maybe I'm a jerk, but that's me. But anyways, enough of me patting myself, breaking my arm, patting myself on the shoulders. But anyways, but God used the makara, the surgical scalpel, to cut out the lies or harshness in my life. And this is talking about the rhema word. He used the rhema word. He spoke to me last week, and, and he used the rhema word to replace the lie, the wrong reasoning, with his truth. Because what happens is sometimes, you know, uh, Pastor Chuck used to say, don't beat the sheep. But I used to, I kind of believe the saying, do you ever see that in the workplace? The beatings will not stop till morale improves. I used to quote that. How many know that's not scripture? Okay, but I used to quote that. Hey, you, and, and even Spurgeon quoted it, so I'm not alone, because Spurgeon said, people said, I hate you talking about giving. And he goes, once you start giving, I'll stop talking about it. <laughs> you know, now he was Spurgeon, so he could get away with that. And, you know, he had a small church of 12,000, so it didn't really matter if a few people left. But, you know, I do that. Man, I could lose, you know, <laughs> could get down to 10. But anyways, um, but God said, uh, he said to me, he replaced the lie with that wrong reasoning with his truth. And he said this to me, and this is what he said to me. And please let this be true, I ask you, if you are hearing. He said, it was my love that touched you, Craig. And I said, yeah, that's right. He says, now let my love through you touch others. And I you can imagine me, I went, but God, but God, they're good. if I love them too much, they're just going to get soft and they're going to start sinning more, Right? You know, I'm too nice to my kid. He'll just take advantage of me. I mean, that's kind of, I could feel my flesh fighting. And God said, shh. And he says, if you love my people, then I will convict them of their sin. I went, that's a good deal. Okay. So if I love them, <laughs> you're going to convict them. Yep, that's my promise to you. And then I said, okay, I need a scripture because I can't just, you know, I can't just have this, you know, I don't want to be Joel's to you, just have, uh, make up stuff. And he gave me Romans 2, 4, knowing that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And I went, you got me. And how many know, you see how the sword went? The sword touched an area of harshness, cut it out. And then replaced it. Because I mean, if you just leave a gaping hole, you're gonna, you got other problems, maybe infection. But when it's cut out, then you need to replace it with the salve and the healing of his word. Mm -hmm. That it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that led me to repentance. So why would I, you know what I mean? If it led me, why wouldn't it lead you? And why should I say, but Lord, we need to be, we need to wake these people up. You know, and the Lord goes, yeah, well, you know, we did your uncle and your grandpa who are harsh to you wake you up, you just ran from them, and you did a lot of drugs, and you, you gave up on life. You almost committed suicide. So, you know, please, all I can say with this, don't hang me with this, please. Don't say you're not being very nice, because I'm not saying I'm not going to preach the word, I bet, because hear this. I might have the harshness issue, but I'd rather be a little hard and deal with that by speaking the truth than be the pastors that say, peace, peace when there is no peace, because I think they're going to have a bigger judgment than I will ever have. Amen. But I want to be balanced. Amen. I want to be like Jesus. I want to love you guys. I love what Chuck said. You know, he's the grandpa. And, and I think my, my daughter said, well, Craig, you're looking like a grandpa. So it's kind of cool. You know, you're looking old. And so he said, you got the belly like Chuck. So be a grandpa. 
love people. Remember, oh, you know, and, you know, just be like, oh, I love you. Oh, come here, you know, oh, you know, and just, you know, oh, you little naughty love, come on, you know. I mean, you know, a grandpa. I want to be a grandpa. You're going to go, this cranky old grandpa, run. I want to be a grandpa that you guys like to be around and that you trust that what I say is God because, you know, I, I, it's not that you speak the truth, but I speak the truth because I love you and I want your best interests. Amen. Amen. We trust that those words are for your betterment, not just to beat you with truth. 